Hello, I'm Eric Dewis, and I'm an engineer here at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And today I'm pleased to tell you about our efforts on designing and manufacturing new mechanical energy absorbing materials. So foams are ubiquitous, and you find them in many applications requiring mechanical energy absor absorption. In application spaces from defense and aerospace to sporting and consumer goods to packaging and transportation. Now in these applications, foams are designed to dampen shock and vibrations, distribute and relieve stresses, maintain relative positioning of components, and mitigate the effect of size variations due to things like manufacturing tolerances and thermal fluctuations. However, foams are also random. And because of this randomness, it's difficult to precisely control mechanical properties. It's also difficult to achieve uniform properties, especially when looking at local scales within foam materials. Finally, there's little control over directional properties, and this is manifested in applications like helmets, where it's very difficult to control both the compressive and shear properties, like one would really want to do. Add all these up, and it's very difficult to actually control, uh, to predict properties in random foams using simulation. Now, ordered cellular materials are much better. And here at the lab, we're developing an added manufacturing or 3D printing approach to enable patterning of cellular materials with controlled, complex, three-dimensional architectures. So we use a 3D printing process called direct ink writing to produce these or ordered cellular elastomers. And we find that these cellular el elastomers enable better control of mechanical properties exhibit more uniform properties, uh, enable better control over directional properties, and also enable a predictive modeling capability. So in this three-dimensional printing process, we extrude a feedstock material or an ink uh, in a layer-by-layer -layer process in a filamentary form, building up upon the underlying layers to produce this ordered cellular structure. To do this, we have to have a detailed understanding of what makes a good ink for good printability. Uh, in the plot shown on the left, we see apparent viscosity versus shear rate. Now at low shear rates, the material has a high viscosity, but with increasing shear rate, it's actually shear thinning or lowers its viscosity. Now this enables extrusion out of nozzles or micro nozzles at smaller or reasonable pressures. Now in the plot on the right, we were looking at the oscillatory flow behavior. So we see uh, storage and loss modulus, and we find that the material is more solid-like at low oscillatory stresses, but has a yield stress and becomes more liquid-like at high oscillatory stresses. This means that the material is more liquid-like when it flows out of the nozzle, but in the absence of shear, it will actually rapidly solidify to maintain its shape to allow this layer-by-layer -layer printing process that I described. Now we've harnessed this 3D printing technology to design and pattern two simple architectures shown here. One is a simple cubic structure, and the other is a face center tetragonal structure. And we've tested these structures under uniaxial compression as well as shear. And here I show the uniaxial compression testing plot for the th third lo loading cycle of these structures. And while both of these structures are printed out of the same base elastomer material at the same volume fraction or degree of porosity, they have different load deformation behavior, with the simple cubic structure being slightly stiffer in initial compression uh, and the face center tetragonal structure being slightly softer. Now again, this is based purely upon the structural differences in the two printed parts. So let's see why this is. This is a cross-section of the simple cubic structure under 0% compression. Now you see in the simple cubic structure, every other layer is overlaid so that the repeat distance is every two layers. Now as we increase the compression from 0% to 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, and 25%, you see that there are uh, continuous solid columns of material that span in the vertical direction. Under increasing compression, these columns become unstable and buckle in the lateral direction or in the horizontal plane. It's because of these solid columns that leads to the 
initial uh, higher stiffness and compression for the simple cubic structure. Let's contrast that with the face center tetragonal structure. Here's a cross section shown at 0% compression. In the face center tetragonal structure, every other layer is shifted in the horizontal plane by half the pitch or center to center spacing. With, so this structure has a repeat distance of every four layers. And as we compress from 0% to 5%, 10, 15, 20, and 25%, you can see that the face center tetragonal structure simply inlays in the gaps in the underlying layers. And it exhibits little lateral deformation like we saw in the simple cubic structure. Because there are no continuous solid columns in the vertical direction, this structure has a softer response in uh, initial compression. The shear behavior is also markedly different for both of these architectures. Here I show plots of the shear stress versus shear strain for the face center tetragonal structure and the simple cubic structure under increasing levels of pre-compression shown in parentheses. Now for the face center tetragonal structure, you can see that uh, we have a positive slope uh, in shear stress versus shear strain, which increases under increasing pre-compression until you hit an event uh, of wall slip in our mechanical test. Now for the simple cubic structure, uh, again, it initially has a positive slope, but then remarkably, that positive slope turns into a negative slope. And in the events of high pre-compression, you can actually achieve negative uh, shear stresses. Now this behavior is something uh, called negative shear stiffness. It's a very unique phenomenon, and it has to do with the fact that when you pre-compress, you're storing strain energy in those solid columns of material that can later be released uh, when there's some lateral deformation to push that shear front forward and give this negative slope, and in some cases, negative shear stress. Again, this is a difference based purely upon the structure of the printed material. Now, these videos will show you the shear behavior for the face center tetragonal stru structure shown here under 25% pre-compression. You can see that it has very uniform deformation in this dynamic strain sweep. Compare that to the simple cubic structure under 25% pre-compression, and you can see it has this snap-through behavior, which is indicative of negative shear stiffness. Uh, one could think about using this uh, effect for various applications, one of which could be to relieve stresses to, re to prevent damage to uh, sensitive components. Now, because we have ordered structures, uh, we can also simulate their behavior in compression and shear. Here are some pseudostatic simulations of compression in the simple cubic structure shown on the left and face center to trigonal structure shown on the right. Now in the simple cubic structure, you can see these uh, solid columns of stress forming under compression, whereas in the face center to trigonal structure, the stress is more distributed and follows a meandering path in, in this particular cross section of the face center to trigonal structure. Uh, you can also model the shear behavior under pre-compression. So here's the simple cubic structure being pre-compressed in the vertical direction. And uh, next you'll see it being sheared. And you see this snap through event uh, known as negative shear stiffness. Now, these uh, technologies present significant opportunity here at the lab, we've demonstrated many different prototypes for a number of different uh, applications. We've also filed patent applications on this technology. We're currently scaling up this technology for production, and we believe that it's ready for commercialization. Finally, here at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, we're working on new designs to determine what is possible and to achieve new performance for new market applications in mechanical energy absorption. So if you'd like to know more, I encourage you to contact our industrial partnerships office, in particular, our business development ex executive, Charity Follett, whose contact information is shown here. Thank you.